So, Jenny was already uh, talking about translational medicine, and I think uh, this topic is a good example of a translational part of, of a drug development for, for a treatment. Uh, the contents of this pre presentation is uh, basically presenting some problems of cardiovascular diseases as a target for gene therapy. And then I present some results of our preclinical PEGF studies in a big model. And then something about these clinical studies we have been performing in Kuopio and also otherwhere, elsewhere in the world. Uh, finally, uh, something uh, about the topic itself. Where are we now in clinical gene therapy? And actually, or, or already raising the question, why aren't we already there? And some future aspects. So as I told you, uh, my perspective is for this study, so that I started 20 years ago by uh, learning to prepare how an adenoviral <coughs> PEG vector is prepared in a lab. And, and then we took the model into uh, first in, in small animals, mice and rabbits in that time and afterwards in bigger animal models in the reasons that we heard from Jenny's presentation. And then three years later, actually 1998, we started the first clinical trials in EGF gene therapy in Kuopio. And I think now we are on the line uh, from bedside to bench to thinking what should or what could we do better uh, in, in animal models and this treatment setting. Cardiovascular diseases, it's a very wide area of, uh, of diseases and uh, the presentation of the disease itself is very multiple. And uh, we basically, the actually the problems we get from the, uh, from the occlusion of vascularity is everywhere in the body. My, in my, of course, in my job, I'm interested in uh, heart diseases but also we do research on the peripheral artery disease and also in cerebral artery diseases. We already have a lot of good treatment methods for these diseases. If we have a coronary stenosis in one or even in two vessels, we can easily treat it by angioplasty or bypass operation. Of course, the cornstone is, is the medical treatment drugs. We have very good <coughs> drugs for cardiovascular diseases, lifestyle changes, etc. Also, some other other special treatments. However, people are living longer currently with our very modern treatment methods, and the number of patients who actually suffer from very severe, uh, very difficult to treat uh, vascular diseases, both, both in heart and elsewhere in the, in the body. And they are called so-called no option patients for revascularization. We don't have very good options for these so-called end stage uh, disease. And, and this population is all the time uh, increasing because the life expectancy is all the time coming older and older. So one idea of treating these patients is a very natural way. It's the idea of a natural bypass or biological bypass as we call it uh, by some vascular growth factors which in fact we have chosen to be. There are tens or hundreds of growth factors or, or factors which affect for vascular growth, but VEGF has been the one which uh, we have chosen and it has been in, in a lot of studies. I don't go through the basic science in, in, in the area of VEGF. I go 
directly to these preclinical animal experiments. But what I can say is that VEGF expression and capillary growth is normally increased in ischemia. Here we can see uh, VEGF uh, immunostaining in normal heart and in, in myocardial infarct zone where the ischemia is, is uh, present. And we can see that VEGF is overexpressed in this area. And also the CD31 capillary staining, we can see that the, the capillary is enlarged in this area. Uh, we know this is familiar, I presume, for many of here, but I just want to present with this slide that there are a lot of uh, factors in, inside this VGF family, and we see that they have a very many uh, good properties regarding vascular diseases, and, and all, all of these can be joined to kind of uh, be used in this gene therapy. We have chosen VEGF A, B, D, and C in these studies. And when we study gene therapy in animal models, and furthermore, in, in clinical uh, patients, we need to think about, in, in addition to this histological uh, changes which we can see in microscopy or, or other or, or by eye we need to see we to see that uh, they also these changes we do are functional and they lead to real uh, increase in the blood flow and and uh, the tissue perfusion and and we have a several several methods to measure in uh, both preclinical and clinical settings, this functionality of, uh, of the treatment. And furthermore, we can measure the symptoms or, or quality of life or such kind of more human parameters. But also we need to always think the side effects on the, uh, on, on other, on the, on the other hand. And regarding VEGF, we can see increased vascular permeability and edema with these treatments. Uh, Jenny told about these <coughs> animal models, and we have a lot of several uh, animal models uh, for, for example, inducing myocardial ischemia and mimicking cardiovascular diseases. And several uh, animals, also small and big animals, has been used. And for these big animal models, we have been doing, uh, we have used this uh, coronary artery embolization and also ameroid constriction to induce more chronic ischemia. Regarding this gene therapy routes, we have a lot of different interventions where the, where the gene transfer can be accompanied. We have an intravenous phase into the uh, human veins or, or palum catheters into the coronaries. And then what we have used in, in our model is this uh, endocardial catheter mediated gene transfer. Few words about this preclinical peak model uh, first. Why peak model is so good in, in regarding clinical gene therapy? It's one reason is, as Yen already told, is that uh, it mimics as, as a regarding the size of the animal, it resembles more like a human heart and cardiovascular system. And uh, we can use similar uh, imaging methods or, or therapy methods as we can use in humans also. In Corpio, we have very nice, uh, actually quite unique uh, 
facilities regarding translational medicine so that we have this uh, AI Virtan Institute, preclinical laboratory, and then National Laboratory Animal Center and University Hospital Clinic just uh, side by side in the same area. So it's very easy to take the pigs into the hospital to make these imaging procedures. Uh, in the first studies, we used this embolization of the LAD coronary artery to induce an infarction area into the uh, tip of the myocardium. Here we can see the area. The gene transfer was done by NOGA system. It's an endocardial delivery system where the catheter is inserted through, ar through the femoral artery into the left ventricle and then the gene is injected through the small needle to several points of the myocardium under the guidance of this kind of electroanatomic mapping here. This is demonstrating the left ventricle where the injections are done and this is an ultrasound image of the catheter inside the left ventricle. This is the, the machine, the computer machine itself. This marker gene transfer is to demonstrate the gene transfer efficiency in, in different areas of the, of the myocardium so that uh, the infarction edge, meaning the area just beside the scar area, is the most uh, so-called ischemic or potent for gene transfer with this beta valve stain. And furthermore, we could see that uh, this ischemic, meaning this uh, edge area of the scar, is more responsive to this VEGF, this lactic, this con control gene transfer. And uh, this is VEGF A, and this is VEGF B gene transfers. These slides, by the way, are delivered to me by Johanna Lachten, who has made these studies. And uh, you can see that in the infarction edge area, the vascularity is very uh, pronounced. It's very, very much increased and enlarged. And also the uh, staining shows that there is a lot of positive cells. In angiogram study, we can see that the vascularity has increased compared to this control peak. Uh, in this VEGF A and B, and in this particular study, there was also this this uh, level growth, growth factor, uh, placental growth, growth factor, and we could see in all these genes the effect of neoangiogenesis. Furthermore, in, in most recent studies uh, by Jussi Murro and, and uh, Paavo Halonen and co-workers, they have made this uh, by this constrictor model where the more chronic ischemia is, is uh, induced by the EGFP and D gene transfer, a PET perfusion. It's an isotope positron emission tomography made an isotope perfusion scan where we can see the myocardial perfusion during rest and during adenosine stress, uh, where we induce like a, a stress situation in the heart, simulating the, the real stress situation. And we could see in this study that the EGFP and this short form of the EGFD led to increased perfusion in myocardium in that area where the gene transfer had been performed by this Noga catheter. And this control peaks only with the CMB promoter injected didn't have such an effect. Normally, the stress-induced increase in myocardial perfusion is about fourfold compared to rest situation, but here we can see uh, 
much more increased perfusion, which is actually statistically significant. And furthermore, just a few weeks ago, we tried a modern CT scanner for this similar myocardial perfusion evaluation so that we took peaks into our radiography clinic and made a CT perfusion scan. The results uh, are under investigation, but this is to demonstrate also the rest and stress uh, perfusion by a CT scan. BEGFB has also some cytoprotective uh, aspects as seen in this Johanna's work, where the control black C compared to BEGFA or, or placental growth factor, we could see the, that BEGFB led to less apoptotic cells. So it was concluded that uh, it prevents for cell apoptosis in myocardium. But as mentioned, there are always this uh, side effect thing which we need to consider. And with VEGF, we know that it's accompanied by uh, vascular uh, permeability and, and edema seen sometimes in, in, for example, in pericardial effusion in echocardiography, as in here with peaks. Here we see the transduced area and extravasated uh, fluid. And we know that this, uh, the mechanism behind this is both a receptor mediated immediate uh, extravasation and also long lasting, uh, more like uh, caused by the somehow fragile uh, arteries leaking the fluid afterwards. So these are the things we need to keep in mind. Then I show shortly the human trials for gene therapy for cardiovascular diseases. Uh, the first study, as I mentioned, was 1998 and 2000 when we started this. Okay, the problem has been all the time the five years here. But here we see that we did the gene transfer intracoronarily in, during the PTCA of uh, coronary artery and injected VEGFA either in adenovirus or plasmid liposome for about 100 patients. And the main result was that compared to the control group, we could see increased perfusion in uh, isotope spec scanning in both uh, VEGF group, but it was mostly but significantly increased in the adenovirus VEGF group. And regarding these side effects or safety issues, we could see that adenoviruses in humans lead to slight increase uh, in temper body temperature, short, short time fever, and uh, elevation of uh, inflammatory parameters, CRP. Uh, then a few years ago, uh, we published the first uh, long-term safety of gene, BEGF gene therapy. Actually, first is eight-year follow-up of coronary patients, and then afterwards, 10-year follow-up for peripheral artery patients. And we could see that uh, no significant in increase was regarding the maze, major adverse cardiac events, death, or any cardiac accidents. Neither was there any increase in uh, cancer or diabetes or such like things. The recent trial in Corpio is this CUT301 trial, which actually just in this summer uh, finished its enrollment of patients. 30 patients were enrolled uh, with, with end stage coronary artery disease with no option for other treatment methods. And this same method, as was described with the big model, was used. And uh, actually, first 15 patients have been published in a BHD study uh, of Kirsi Muona. Uh, and, and it was seen that it's safe and well tolerated. We did see a slight 
uh, pericardial fluid only few millimeters in three patients, but it was like uh, not clinically significant, but no other side effects was seen. And actually this study has now been ended and uh, I have heard that it will be published in American Heart Association this autumn, the results, final results. And currently we have uh, several trials for <coughs> cardiovascular diseases, five against coronary artery disease and uh, four against heart failure, which both are very important clinical settings for gene therapy. Both has a lot of patients, both have patients who kind of are increasing number who need uh, additive treatment. We don't have a curative treatment either of those. We have a good methods to palliate uh, the, and, and, in, and lengthen the, the lifespan. But after all, there is always these patients who anymore cannot be treated with traditional methods. And uh, this CAR trial is now will end it. There are a few trials which has uh, shown some positive uh, trend. Here uh, was a trend for uh, men postmenopausal women, uh, positive trend, and I, I think they are currently enrolling these postmenopausal women for a trial. Uh, Cupid 2B, which was against the CERCA, to a uh, gene therapy against uh, heart failure was shown negative last April and, and uh, agent heart failure was all, all also negative but uh, others we are waiting for the results. If we think globally cardiovascular trials, gene therapy trials is a very small number if we compare it for example to cancer uh, disease. And if we think about the history, we can see that during these 25 years, there has been uh, hundreds of gene therapy trials, but still we have uh, one and single gene therapy medicine on the market, Glybera, which is the only one currently in Europe. And, and that's, the, that's the question, why after, after all, why there is only this one drug available in the market to be bought into hospitals. And I think there are several reasons which uh, Jenny already something told about, but also new legislation in EU made, made the process of gene therapy, clinical gene therapy trials much more hard than it used to be. And uh, it's, it's of course good they are looking for the safety risks of this new therapy, but of course it also means a lot of uh, work in the, uh, these research groups. For example, if we think about our trials, we started 20 years ago when the first clinical trial started phase one trial, uh, made this phase two <coughs> trial and what still need to be done is the phase three trial before getting into markets. And I think it's only some cardiovascular cell, cell therapy uh, treatments, BAMI for example, uh, in, in myocardial infarction, which are already in phase three. So they are getting nearer and nearer. And I, I dare to uh, hope that they will be uh, uh, cardiovascular gene therapy drug also in the market in the future. Also the problem of these trials is that we have used very hard clinical endpoints, deaths, hospitalization, infarctions, that kind of things, which we use, have used to have used in, in a pharmacotherapy trials with 30,000 of patients, but we never can do that in a gene therapy trials, we have only few patients, so it's very difficult to prove the significant treatment effect which the, uh, the regularities wants to see before getting markets. So in future we need uh, more different methods and, and I wanted to show in this presentation that for example imaging is a very good uh, endpoint. And then also uh, current clinical trials have enrolled mainly very old and sick and, and severely attacked 
applications, which makes it uh, very hard to kind of get the real effect of the therapy to be present. And this once more animal model is never a human disease. And that makes it very important to remember that the patient in the hospital is never like a like a laboratory animal. It's very sick, has a lot of comorbidities, very end stage uh, things, a lot of drug therapy. Mostly these therapies are added on the optimal therapy which the patient is already getting and, and we can never study that kind of settings in the animal models and that's the discussion I think how it should be that we more and more raise the questions from the clinics onto the laboratory. I want to thank all the collaborations who delivered me the, the slides and ideas and, and, and we also have been co-working with Turku Pet Center with these pets please. <laughs> I didn't have an image of the peaks with the more chronic infarction model actually Antti and Paavo and all other uh, our guys are currently working with the model where they put a constrictor inside the LCX or LAD coronary artery where it constricts it slowly and it, it, it should demonstrate more chronic ischemia and actually the pet perfusion uh, images were from that model it's different but I the lack of time I wouldn't show everything but I uh, I agree that we cannot like uh, compare the infarction model totally to the chronic ischemia but I think there are a lot of uh, similarities regarding histology and uh, uh, gene transfer efficiency and that kind of things and echocardiography yes we have performed <coughs> uh, in this CAT 301 trial especially and the results are now under investigation, so I, I think they will present them in AHA. I don't know what, what has happened, but we have measured it earlier. No, we didn't kind of realize to do it. It was 20 years ago, so now we know more, but very good question. Okay. Um, yes, please. I have also, thank you very much for your talk. It was really interesting. I have a question. Um, you said that the patients were elderly and severely affected, and this is a drawback of testing. But aren't this patient the major target group for your treatment? I mean, elderly patients. So aren't you developing the drug to treat these patients? So you have to have the response from these exact patients? It's always like that, that you need to start the therapy with patients who don't have any options. You have the kind of uh, ethical and legal uh, licenses to do so. But when you prove the efficacy and safety of the therapy, you can transfer it to the earlier phases of therapy. And I think uh, definitely it is so that the full potential of this kind of therapy would be seen in more healthy patients who has still some capacity to recover but if you start in the patients who have already used all their capacity for their very severe disease, it's hard to like uh, make it better in any any treatment. 
But that, that, that's a dilemma in this kind of study that you need to start there. But, but I uh, definitely that this therapy will go like, uh, like we started with, for, the, for example, uh, the heart failure pacemaker treatment was first put on the patients who were already on bed and they slightly could stand up. And now we put them on the patients with, by guidelines tell us to put patients who have uh, uh, chest pain or, or, or dyspnea in a uh, heart exercise. So that we, it's like the, all these new treatments come like that. Okay. Thank you.